student assignment. And this is kind of general for all the versions of the student assignment because they sort of build it on each other, build on each other. So um, I don't think I deducted for any of these problems, but I made notes. So you should be aware uh, of this and, and keep it in mind. First of all, if you have something that's calculated, you probably don't need an attribute for it. So for example, in lab five, you had total payments. On lab, one of the labs, you had total uh, credit hours. So you're going to have a method that calculates the total payments, a method that calculates the total credit hours. Some of you did that and also had a payment attribute. That's probably not a good idea because then you'd have to ensure that the two stayed in sync. All right. In other words, you'd have to make sure that um, whenever you added a payment, that you added it to the total attribute as well. If you're calculating it and you have a method of calculating it, don't store it as an attribute. You can always just calculate it. So don't store the fact that someone has $1,500 worth of payments. Just have a routine, uh, a method that says, give me the total number of payments. That way, if you go and add a payment, you don't have to adjust the attribute. You just put it in the array list. If you want to calculate it, you call that function again to calculate it. So if it's calculated, you probably don't need an attribute for it. All right. If it's just a plain attribute, like the student's name that can't be calculated, um, you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't uh, you, of course, you'd have it as an attribute. Um, but something that's calculated, you don't need an attribute for. Each function should do one really clear, defined task. So I had some people write something that uh, wrote, wrote functions that calculated the total number of payments but also calculated the total due and printed out the total due. All right? It's so probably not, you probably are combining things that should be in two functions, right? Because you might want to be able, you might have to uh, do the calculation of calculating the total payments without printing out any of them. And you might not be interested in the total amount due, you might be interested in what the total number of payments are. If each one of them performs a certain function, one relatively narrow defined function, one real specific thing, then you can piece them together however you want to. So for example, in this case, I would have like three functions. I would have calculate, or actually four functions. Calculate credit hours. Calculate tuition. Calculate total payments. Calculate amount due. Each one of these does one really narrow defined task and just does that task. So, and they can call each other. So to calculate tuitions, you have to call calculate credit hours. And you shouldn't have the code duplicated from calculate credit hours in calculate tuition. You should simply call the function calculate credit hours and use the results from that in determining the credit hours when you calculate tuition. Likewise, if calculate amount due, all it would be would be two function calls. You could do something like this. Double equals this calculate tuition minus this calculate total payments. The idea of not having duplicated code is important. So you wouldn't have the code that calculated the total payments, you simply call the function that already does it. If you make that function then you can use it anywhere in that class where you need to know the total payments. So if you need to balance due, the balance due is simply the total tuition minus the total payments. So you would go in and, and call uh, the respective functions as opposed to duplicating the code there. 
the problem is, is like, is like I said, if you have a function that does two things, like calculate tuition and print it out, you have to do them both as a package, right? You can't do one without the other. You can't break it off. So make your functions do one very small, specific task. And if you need to call two functions to do the whole task, you'd call two functions then. The other thing is generally your outputting of data is going to be in your user interface, or in our case, the test class. I know some of you put in the student's class like print out total payments, and that was fine. It's not a big deal. But generally most of that stuff, because you don't know how someone's going to want to display the payments. Maybe someone wants to see the total, maybe on one report you see the total payments. On another report you see each payment individually, and so on. If you leave that up to the UI, then you can call the functions on the class and get the data that you need and format it any way that you want. Describe what your function's doing. And if there's the word and in it, the function's probably too big. So if you have a function that says calculate tuition and payments, that's probably not a good function. You should break it down to have one function that calculates tuition and another function that calculates payments. So anytime you see the word and in a function, or for that matter, I suppose, anytime you see those things in there, then your function is probably doing too much. And in which case, you're better off breaking it down. Breaking it down again just makes little chunks that you can call and you can piece together in any sequence that you want to simply by writing uh, code that does that. All right. Now, like I said, I have caught up. Uh, I have made progress towards catching up. I won't say I've caught, not, caught up yet. Uh, you should review my comments. The one thing I want to mention in this class, a couple things I want to mention in this class. Number one, the drop boxes are for assignments that you think are completed. All right. So don't turn something in just to turn something in if you know that there's problems with it. So if it doesn't compile, you get a compile error, then you should be emailing me and say, hey, I'm having this problem with that, as opposed to, to, to just turning it in. We've all seen how even if I am on schedule with my grading, I'm, o I'm only going to be grading things maybe once, one or two days a week. right? So if you were to upload something today, it might be a few days before I get to it to grade it, even if I was 100% caught up. All right? My email, on the other hand, I check pretty frequently. So if you email me something, we can address it quickly. I would suggest if you're having trouble with stuff, don't be shy in lab. Talk to me in lab about the problems that you're having, and we'll, we'll work through them. All right. Um, I know some of this stuff is not straightforward. It's, it's not easy. It's, programming is hard. And so I understand. So if you're having difficulty with something, talk to me about it in lab as opposed to turning in something that isn't completed and has a number of issues with a note uh, on it there. If you uh, are working on it between labs, email it to me. But don't just turn it in as completed. All right, questions about this. All right, here's what we're going to do. We talked about a couple of things last week, uh, interfaces, abstract classes, um, boxing and unboxing. Um, trying to think what else. Um, today we're going to try, uh, we're going to start on try catches, which I'm sure you probably have all done in C sharp. Is that correct? Ideas works the same. We might go in a little more in detail about them, but the notion works the same. So let's look at an example I have. I'm going to bring this up. We're going to first look at a very common error or problem that people have.
I think I used this last semester to talk about boxing and exceptions. But we talked about boxing last week, so I'll streamline this example a little bit. Let's say I have an array list of integers. And I can't make an array list of ints because ints are primitives. So what we have in Java is we have these wrapper classes that sort of wrap around our primitives that are classes, that are object references. So we can create an array list of them. So I can make this. So I make an integer with a capital I and the full word integer, and I give it a value equals 3. Essentially what that's doing is that's taking a primitive integer and it's storing it in an integer class. Then I'm going to add that to my array list. I'm going to loop through the array list and I'm going to square I'm going to square the value. All right, so let's go and look at this. Okay. Okay, compiled it, now I run it, and it tells me 3 squared is 9, so it works. All right, I'm going to break it now. I'm going to create an integer, and I'm not going to assign it any value. And I'm going to array that ob uh, create that, uh, add that object to the array list. So I've not initialized this value at anything. Okay? And I'm going to add it to the array list. Let's see what happens now.
It knows that I've done that. It knows that I have created a variable and I have not uh, initialized it. So it's not going to let me add it to the array list. Because bad things could happen if I get a variable that isn't initialized in my array list. All right? There's two kinds of errors that you can get in programming. At least the, I'm going to separate them into two kinds of errors. There's compile errors and there's runtime errors. This is a compile error. This is where the compiler knows that I violated the rules of the language. All right? And it's not going to let me even run that program. Right? It's not going to let me compile it and run it. Because it knows that I've done something that's wrong or potentially wrong. All right? Another example of a compile error would be something like this. I'm going to initialize it as hello. Well, hello isn't an integer, therefore it's going to blow up. So it gives me an error. All right, because string can't be converted into an integer. So compilers are where you've broken the rules of the language in such an obvious way that the compiler knows that it can't possibly work. And it gives you a compile error and you can't run the program. Those are actually the good errors to get, right? Because Java, the Java compi compiler will keep you from doing damage. All right? You get that error, you know that the program isn't working. You have to go back and revise it in order to get it to work so that you can compile it. The tougher errors to deal with are runtime errors. And what runtime errors are, are errors where sometimes they cause a problem and sometimes they don't cause a problem. So let's do this. I'm going to create an integer i equal to 3 and jj equal to 4. And I'm going to add both those to my array list and I'm going to print it out and it should go and do its thing and tell me 3 squared is 9, 4 squared is 16. So I compile it. I forget the semicolon. I put it back in. I run it, 3 squared is 9, 4 squared is 16. All right, so we're in business. Now let's say I have some code that only happens some of the time. All right? Let's put a random generator in here. Do we remember what math random does? We use that, and we said math random. It gives us a number between 0 and 0 0.9999, right? Let's look that up to verify. I think that's what we used in our first homework assignment. Java math random gives us a number from 0 less than 1. So 0.9999 repeating. So I'm going to say if math random is less than 0.25, I'm going to set JJ to a null object. A null object is where uh, we have an object reference pointer that doesn't point to an object at all. All right? So this is going to happen approximately how often? 25% of the time. All right? So one out of four times, I'm going to set this to null. And when we set that to null, 
we're going to have an issue, right? Because how do you square nothing? What is nothing squared? Remember, null doesn't mean zero. Null means there's no value. All right, there's no value. It's like saying, what is your bank balance at key bank? And you don't have an account at key bank. Your balance isn't zero, right? A balance of zero means something, right? That you don't have any money in your account. You literally, if you have no account, then you have no balance. Your balance could be said to be null. So that's what we mean when we say a null. So this will give us an error approximately 25% of the time. It doesn't give me a compile error. Why not? Well, because the compiler is smart, but the compiler isn't extremely smart. Remember, it's still a machine that is just simply translating this into byte code. It sees that JJ got initialized. Therefore, I can add it to the list. But, at this point, I'm going and I'm wiping out JJ. So the compiler isn't clever enough to see that this is going to lead to trouble, even though it will, one out of four times. So now I go and run this. All right, it works. It works. Yeah, maybe let's try that. That doesn't really make sense to me, but Boom, third time, all right, blew up. Not really sure why I had to switch the order of it, but I did, all right. So it blew up, all right, the third time. And it blew up with a classic programming error. It's, it's almost like you haven't programmed in Java until you've gotten this error like a million times. No pointer exception. Let's first of all explain what that means. And let's go in and let's talk about what actually is happening here. All right? In this code. In fact, I'm going to change the syntax to this to look like this. And we should have the same results. Okay, it happened the second time. So let's look at this code. And let's try to understand what's happening. I'll first talk about what happens when we don't get the air. All right? 
So we're going to assume that this if statement is false. First line says integer i, i equals new integer 3. What does that do? That creates a pointer called integer, or a pointer of type integer named i, i, and I can point to integers with this. On the heap then, I st create my integer object that has a value of 3, and whatever that memory location is gets stored in my pointer. So I now have an object called ii that's at location 2000 and ii points to location 2000, the variable. So that's after this line gets executed. The next line does essentially the same thing but creates another variable called jj and creates another integer object. Okay, so let's say it creates it in location 2016. So I have two objects in the heap that are pointed to by two variables in the stack. So ii points to that first object, jj points to that second object. All right, we say that this is false the first time through. So we leave j alone. We then go in and add i and j to our array list. So our array list, called c, points to an array list somewhere in memory. And has the different pointers in it. Pointer to 2000, a pointer to 2016. So that's our array list that's in the variable C at that location. So we loop through it. And we say, OK, give me the first element in the list. Square it and output it. So 3 squared is 9. Get the second one. 4 squared is 16. And we output that. So what happens is we loop through. We grab the pointer. Our first integer is here, so we go get the value from it, square it, and output 9. Second one, we grab the second object that's at location 2016, grab it, square it, and output 16. All right? So, so far, so good. What happens, however, when we do this? When we say one out of four times, I'm blanking out what's in that variable. What happens is this. <coughs> if that is true, then this j gets cleared out. So there is nothing in it. Not a zero, but nothing. 2016, this object here, no one points to it anymore. So it gets what? What's the term for when there's no object, no, nothing pointing to an object? It gets marked for garbage, uh, garbage disposal, garbage collection. So this object disappears from memory because no one points it to it anymore. So now, we come into this and we say jj is equal to null, so there's nothing in here. We add that jj to the array list. We've added a pointer to nothing, because jj points to nothing. How do we know jj points to nothing? That's what the statement says. And we're assuming the if statement is true. So we're adding a pointer to the array list, but that pointer points to nothing. So we come down through and try to grab that value and square it. Well, the second value has nothing in it. So we can't square nothing and we get our error. 
Any questions about this? It's a classic Java error that when you're dealing with objects, if you're not careful, you're liable to get an object, a pointer to an object that doesn't exist. And that's called a null object reference. Because it points to no object. There's no object out there that it points to. And again, the compiler isn't smart enough to figure out that this could happen. The compiler lo looks at our code, but in a very brute force mechanical way. The compiler doesn't execute our code and say, ooh, wait a minute, this is going to cause me trouble. It doesn't realize that causes me trouble. And therefore, it doesn't flag it as an error. But a certain percentage of the time, we get an error. This was frustrating for programmers, right? Because someone could call in and say, your program blew up. And it's like, OK, let me run it and test it. What are they talking about? It worked perfectly, all right? And then they call back in a week and say, no, it blew up again. And you could run it again. And if you're lucky, it'll say, oh, OK, now I see that it blew up, all right? That's why it's good when you're working support, application support, and you're talking to customers that have errors with your program, to get as much detail as possible from them about what happened. Because that'll help you trace through and figure out what's wrong. Now again, no one writes code to randomly blow up one out of four times, right? However, if you have a bug in your code that you have not tested for, all right, under the right circumstances, it's possible that an object that you think gets created doesn't get created. All right? With modern applications, consider something like Word, an application like Word that's gigantic, millions of lines of code. There's going to be things that you know, probably have not completely been tested. Certain situations that just, you know, you hit and hasn't been tested, and that causes it to blow up, all right, under the right circumstances. So these are the worst errors to find, because they, the program dies, and if you haven't done good error catching, you sort of have limited idea of exactly what's going on. What we want to do is we want to put sort of a safety net on our code. We're going to make our code so that if it runs into an unexpected problem, at the very least, it won't just up and blow up. It will do its best to handle it in a graceful way that maybe reports exactly what the error is and maybe creates a file that describes what happened and whatever we want but report the errors in a more graceful way rather than just having the code blowing up and maybe giving us something that maybe to a programmer makes sense, but to a, a regular user isn't going to make sense. OK, that's what we mean when we say try catch. All right? What we can do is we can catch for we can catch for all sorts of kinds of problems. So I'm going to wrap this on a try catch. And it starts out with the word try. Any block of statements that I think could cause me problems, I'm going to put in a try. This is one that I know it'll be a problem if one of these objects is null. So yeah, I know that could potentially cause a problem. So I'm going to put a try here, and I'm going to catch exception E. And now. I can output something and say there was 
bad data in that array list. The idea here is we'd put something descriptive that a layperson would understand instead of just null pointer exception that would be very cryptic and not meaningful to them. So now when we do this, All right. Well, it worked, right? As it will one out of four times. Ah, there's bad data in the array list. Depending on the specific program that you're talking about, if you find an error, you have different choices of action. Sometimes you can do something with that error. Maybe if we were processing, let's say, a list of student payments, and there was a problem with this student's payment, we could skip it and continue on and do the rest of the student's payments. All right? So that would keep things from blowing up. All right? And then maybe we could write to a report to say there was a problem with this payment and write some information out there. If it was a program that was connected to a, a GUI, a graphical user's interface, if someone entered some wrong data, we could simply display a nice message that says, hey, you entered that second number wrong. All right. So usually there's something we want to do, and depending on a particular problem and particular situation, what we want to do changes a little bit. Maybe we do want to stop and not do anything more, and we just want to end the program there if we run into a problem. Or maybe we just want to skip that one piece of data and go on to the next piece of data. Well, when you're handling the errors yourself, you can code it and you can tell it what to do. All right? Questions about this? So like, if we had, let's say, 100 of these, which is too much to type, so I'll do three instead. I'm going to start off and I'm going to get rid of the try catch to show you what's going to happen if we get that error in the middle of processing a list of data. All right. It processes all three. Second time we run it, processes all three again. Third time we run it, it does the first one, blows up on the second, doesn't even try the third. Because when it blows up, it blows up. All right. What we can do instead is we can wrap the try-catch around these guys here. I actually am moving my try-catch from outside of the loop to inside of the loop, which is probably a better place to demonstrate what it is that I wanted to try. So now, if there's a problem with the second piece of data, I can still go in and continue to process the other pieces of data. And I could make my error message anything that would help me research the error. I could say blue up at item So it blew up at item one. All right. 
Remember that we start numbering with zero, so this is item zero, this is item one, but it still goes on and finishes the list. So instead of terminating and not being able to do anything after the first thing that has a problem, it's able to go and do everything after it, too. Because we're handling the errors. We say, hey, if there's a problem, this is how I'm going to handle it. Someone has to handle the error, either you or the Java runtime engine. The Java runtime engine handles the error in a ruthless way. It just stops and spits out some kind of error message that may or may not be meaningful to you. And if we're handling the error, we can do anything we like. We can display that error message and we can just continue on our merry way and process the next one and the next one and the next one. Questions about this? Now, E, this exception object, gets created when there's an exception. Think of that as like sort of the police report of the crash, all right, of the problem. This object E contains information about what happened, about what went wrong. And let's look at the exception object and let's look for some of the things that we can do with it. The exception contains inherits from something called throwable. It inherits from that get cause get message, get stack trace, print stack trace, to string, and so on. So a lot of things that we can ask the exception object or its ancestor. In this case, the ancestor has more of the methods. So I could go in and I could put an error message Skipping item number and then I could call one of the methods on the exception class to get more details about exactly what went wrong. The to string is a good method to call. Almost every object has a toString method. What that does is it points, puts out a short string explanation of what the object contains. In this case, toString for an exception is going to give me a little bit of information about the error that happened. So I'm going to go and compile and run. In this case, it tells me that 3 squared is 9. I'm skipping line on line 1 because of null pointer exception. All right? And then 5 squared is 25. I'll put that on one line to make it a little more concise. Oh, I commented that I kind of commented the wrong one out. I want to comment this one out. Skipping item number one. All right. That way, again, that gives us a fighting chance. Let's look at some of the other things that are available on that. We have a 
print stat trace. If to string is the method that gives us like a concise description of like exactly what went wrong, print stack trace is like the full testimony from the police officer and the cross examination and everything else. So Get stack trace, not print stack trace, is what I wanted. Okay, it worked. Worked. All right, that gives us that. Hmm. Maybe that's not what I wanted. Try this. There we go. And that gives us more information about the problem that we have. Didn't give me as much information as I thought. I might not be calling the wrong method on it. All right, at any rate, the E object that we're calling here is information about the error or exception of just uh, uh, occurred. All right. I imagine you did stuff like this in C sharp. All right. What we're going to talk about next time is throwing our own exceptions, which is my experience that I don't think you do necessarily in C sharp. I think you catch exceptions, but we're going to start throwing some exceptions too. So that's what we'll do next time. So I'll see you in lab. Mm -hmm.